Hi everybody, this is Brian James from Rhino3D.com and in this Rhino7 video I want to talk to you about post effects. Post effects are adjustments you can make on a render while it's running or after it is completed. And post effects are available to you if you're in the ray traced display mode under this star section and you can add any post effects here that you have installed or already enabled in the document. You can also add post effects when you run the render command and you'll have a list in the render window that pops up. But before we go through some of my favorite post effects, I want to point out the new NV7 toolbar. Here you'll find the package manager command and you'll want to run the package manager command to add a few denoiser plugins that'll show up in your post effects and you can search for denoise and you're going to see three options. The Intel denoiser is the one that I recommend most because it's not hardware dependent. It will run on any computer and any CPU. The AMD denoiser would require a specific supported AMD graphics card and the Nvidia denoiser would likewise require an NVIDIA graphics card that is supported. But the Intel denoiser will run on any system. You can install these and then restart Rhino and you'll have them in your post effects list. Now here I'm running ray traced mode on a scene, an interior scene, and everything has a white plaster material aside for a few exceptions such as glass in the windows and an emission material for the lamp. If I go into that star section of properties while this ray traced mode is running, I can click the plus symbol here and add any post effects. You can also run the render command and the render window will pop up. If you do that when ray traced mode is running, the ray traced mode will be paused and the render will begin. And here you can see we have an identical layout of post effects on the left side, such as we had in the properties panel. This all white scene is a really good case to start with and to showcase the use of the denoiser plugins. Now these denoiser post effects will wash out grain and that grain is notorious in scenes that are interior lighting where there's a lot of light bouncing around. So if we click the plus symbol, I can add the Intel denoiser. And although I've only reached 38 samples, 40 samples, as you can see here in the lower left corner of the render window, I can enable the denoiser so that you get an idea of what it does. So it removes that grain and at a low sample count like this, we lose a little bit of surface definition and if we had materials on the models we would lose some detail in the textures on those materials. So you want to make sure that you get to a sample count high enough that you don't lose too much detail. So it's a balancing act but in general I'll get to 150 to 300 samples before I apply the denoiser. If you want to save your post effects, you can click this little save icon and that will save any that you've set up to the 3DM file. You can also load post effects from a document here. So I'm going to stop this render and go into a different setup. So first I'll go to rendered mode. Now rendered mode is happening on the graphics card, but it does not process how light bounces around in the scene. It's great for setting up materials and texture mapping though. And in this file, I have a snapshot saved where we have a whole bunch of materials and texture mapping already set up. And then I'll start the render again so that we can compare the result when you have materials versus an all white scene. Typically lighting adjustments and what settings you have to use for the render are going to be dependent on the materials and lighting in the scene. So you don't want to set up everything when everything's all white. You want to at least get uh, basic material set up first. And here we can see we've got the grain. We've only gotten to 
16 samples so far. And the size of this image is 1080p, so 1920 by 1080 at the moment. Now if I add that Intel denoiser again, it'll be more obvious that a low sample count, although washing out the grain, that a low sample count will not be sufficient because I'm going to lose too much detail in the, the print in the background on the wall and texture in, say, the fabric on the chair, for instance, is, is not being represented any longer. The denoiser can't determine detail that we want from noise in the scene. Some other plugins, uh, post-effect plugins, that you'll have by default are Bloom, which I like to use quite a lot. And so I'll enable Bloom here and we can talk a little bit about that. Now the Bloom post effect is going to have these three sliders, brightness threshold, a radius, and an intensity. And especially around the lamp here, you can see that uh, we get this blooming effect. It's sort of that light, that luminance jumps in front of the edge of the, the sofa chair there. And so what I typically like to do is drop down the threshold and this is going to make it so that more areas of bright pixels in the scene receive the bloom treatment. So around the windows in the back here or the light bouncing off the ceiling right there, those areas start to get it if the threshold is real low. So you can see in contrast if I bring it up, these don't get it as much. So I'll typically drop down the threshold, increase the radius, which is an area around the pixels that are being affected, and then I'll drop down the intensity. It's very easy to make these types of post effects too aggressive at first, and what I want here is a very subtle effect. And I'll toggle it on and off to see how much I'm impacting the image. Probably drop the intensity down just a little bit more. There we go. And all this time, the ray tracing is calculating and we have reached uh, 110 samples and at this point the denoiser is letting us keep more detail in the materials. Now without it, if we turned it off you can see for comparison how much grain we still have in the image. This type of grain is notorious for non-biased renderers and Rhino 7 is using the cycles render engine under the hood and that non-biased calculation will produce realistic images but at the cost of grain and that's where these denoisers are, are super useful. Some other areas of the post effects section here that I want to point out are tone mapping and final pass. The tone mapping section by default will be set to clamp and what this section does is compress the image tonally so that you don't have areas that are too bright or too dark. There are a bunch of options here you can play with and it's very scene dependent so I would recommend trying different ones to see what you like but the filmic one which defaults to the medium contrast method is my personal favorite. In the final pass section you can add post effects and adjustments like hue saturation luminance and brightness contrast. I'll restore both of these to the defaults before I show you how I like to adjust them. First off, the luminance one, hue saturation luminance, will affect the brightest areas in the image. So as I bring up the luminance here, the area around the lamp, which is very bright, and the area in the sunlight hitting the floor, these areas will brighten up more than surrounding pixels. Saturation will make your colors richer. So if I bring this up, the color of the wood tabletop as well as that orange chair in the background, these are going to get brighter and more saturated as we do that. I'll bring that one back down. Now the difference between luminance and brightness, if we go into the brightness contrast, I'll enable that final pass and then raise my brightness value just to point out that the entire image gets whiter. 
So that's the difference between the luminance one and brightness. So brightness will be the whole image. Luminance will just be impacting the uh, brighter areas of the image. With the brightness contrast final pass, I like to raise the contrast at the same time to avoid that washing out of the image. And I typically don't go that far with, with these um, adjustments, maybe 0.2 and 1.2. And then the luminance, in this case, I'm really am blowing out where the lamp is. It's getting far too bright, as you can see. So luminance is interesting. You could actually drop down luminance instead so that you don't have as aggressive a result uh, due to the additional use of brightness contrast. All right, I'll stop this render and bring up uh, another named view to showcase an additional post effect here. So I've got some named views here and I'll go to this Apple one and start the render. And all the objects in the scene get transferred to memory, all the textures get baked so that we can start the render. These plants, by the way, are from the Rhino Nature plugin and were baked into the scene so that they could be added to the renderer with uh, Rhino Render. Now I want to focus the eye right here on the apple rather than have the viewer looking at the background. I want to focus the foreground in the image. So I'll use a post effect called Depth of Field. Now you can adjust the settings for the camera uh, and calculate focal blur, but if you want, you can use depth of field as a post effect instead. Focal blur and depth of field are, are synonymous in this regard. So if I bring up depth of field here, we've got these three categories, blurring strength, max blurring, and the focal distance. To set the focal distance, you can click on this little icon here with a cursor, and then pick the spot in the scene that you want to focus on. The blurring strength will be the overall power of the post effect, and the max blurring value refers to the radius used around the pixels that get blurred. So I'll increase that blurring strength bring up the max blurring and I'm watching what happens in the background here as I do this. I typically do not make them that far from what the defaults are but you can see here if we go to 20 for blurring strength and max blurring to 15 we get a pretty drastic blur in the background there. If the ray trace is calculating, if the render is still calculating, you'll see it flicker on and off you can stop the render and then add these post effects, but otherwise, as new sample counts get achieved, the post effect will get reapplied. I'll add the Intel denoiser here again, and I'm also going to reorder these post effects. So you can click on a post effect, drag it, and you'll see a little blue line, so you can change the order. In this case, I'm going to have the denoiser happen first and then the depth of field post effect. Go into the tone mapping, add that filmic tone mapper, and I'll adjust brightness contrast as well here. There we go. And that's an introduction to post effects in Rhino 7. So poke around here, you can see that there are other ones, but those are the ones that I tend to use myself. And I hope you enjoy using these. Don't forget about the package manager command and loading the Intel denoiser at least. If you've got an NVIDIA or AMD graphics card that's uh, fairly recent, you can also load those denoisers and try those as well. I'll finish off this video by showing you some renders of other named views in this model, both with post effects off and then on. 
The methods I used here were the same as in the video. The only difference is these were larger images at 4K resolution, but otherwise the techniques are the same. And that's an overview of post effects in Rhino 7. I hope you find these useful when visualizing your own models. And thanks for watching.